Well, I want to add my welcome. It's so good to have you all here this morning. And I welcome those who are worshiping at our Clayton site, those who are listening online. I appreciate all the notes of encouragement that I get both before and after uh, these sermons, uh, the birds, the bees, and the Bible. And so I appreciate you all being here. And today we have a tough task in front of us. We're talking about what the Bible says about same-sex relationships. And a pastor this morning, I guess knowing that I would get on Facebook early, wrote me a note saying, you know, Matt, it's not too late to just, uh, you know, punt. And you could preach like on the lost sheep or something, you know, <laughs> easy. And it's true. I mean, I've, I, honestly, on this issue, I've lost friends. I've lost uh, parishioners. I've lost givers. I've lost potential staff. Uh, it's a divisive issue. But you all that have been coming here a while know that uh, we have to talk about issues like this. And there's too many churches that, quite frankly, are just cowardly. And I don't think cowardliness has any place within God's church. So we're going to talk today about what the Bible has to say about same-sex relationships. And let me just start with some opening remarks. We have a lot of work to do this morning, so we're going to kind of move quickly. So I hope that's okay and that you can keep up. A couple opening things. First, I'm going to deal this morning with same-sex relationships, gay and lesbian people, and I'm, I'm well aware that language and understanding of gender and sexual identities is proliferating so that these are not the only two categories or things that we could talk about. We could talk about asexual or intersexual or people who are questioning or transgendered. And I realize that those issues are out there. I think they're important issues, but they're not the ones that I'm going to deal with today. We'll deal with them perhaps at a a different point in time. So I just want to say that up front, that I'm aware, but we're going to sort of talk strictly about same-sex relationships. Secondly, I'm going to talk about what the Bible says about these relationships. And some of you uh, are excited to hear that. Others of you would love if we just sat up here and talked about what I think about it, which I'll get to at the end, uh, but also if the sermon were primarily about opinions, research, contemporary understandings, those things are all really critical. But I have a bottom line belief that we throw around, uh, the Bible says this, the Bible says that, that we need here in the church to sit down and understand what the Bible actually says and doesn't say. I think that'll inform our thinking. So we're going to focus our attention there. Thirdly, I need to say that I take the Bible seriously. And I know some don't. And some people read the Bible and it's easy for them to dismiss it. I don't do that. I take it seriously. I believe that it's the inspired Word of God, that it's inerrant in its revelation. I don't believe we can ignore it or counter it with just our own opinions or experiences. We have to make sense of it. And then lastly, and this follows up on that point, we also have to work hard to interpret the Scripture. We cannot simply read it and say, the Bible says it, I believe it. Anybody who says that, don't listen to them. They don't know what they're talking about, quite frankly. We have to make a whole bunch of choices when we read the Scripture And we make those choices under the Spirit's guidance. So we have to read Scripture, understand what it says, and then apply it to our lives. And that process is not an easy one. It's not always a clear one. And all of us, no matter what camp we're in, liberal, conservative, you have to make a set of choices to apply Scripture to your life. And so we're going to talk about some of those choices today. So with all that being said, we're going to dive in right off the bat. And I said that if you brought your Bible, that's great. We're going to be flipping around. If you don't have a Bible and you want one, our Linda and over at the Clayton site, we have people in the back who have Bibles. Go back there, grab one if you want one, and follow along. We're going to start in the Old Testament. We're going to talk about five passages today. I think there's five passages in Scripture that clearly talk about uh, same-sex relationships or sex between Uh, men and between women. There's a possible sixth one, which we'll talk a little bit about. We're going to start in the Old Testament. We're going to start with Leviticus. Leviticus is on the left-hand side of your Bible. It's like toward the beginning. And uh, Leviticus, you know, it's a tough book. This is the book that if you've ever tried to read the Bible straight through, Leviticus is the book that you die in. You get to Leviticus, and you finally decide this was a dumb idea, the Bible doesn't apply to my life, I'm done with the Bible. And you might never get to Leviticus chapter 18. But let me read two related verses. These are our first two verses. Uh, Leviticus chapter 18, 
verse 22. Let me read this one. It says, you shall not lie with a male as with a woman. It is an abomination. That's the verse. And then let me flip over because it's right in line with that. It's in chapter 20, verse 13. It says this, if a man lies with a male as with a woman, both of them have committed an abomination. They shall be put to death, their blood is upon them. Okay. Those are the first two verses. Two very short verses, both contained in Leviticus. So let's talk a little bit about Leviticus. On the one hand, these are some of the clearest passages actually in Scripture about same-sex relationships. There are plenty of people who look at it and say, look, the Bible says it, I believe it. There's nothing more you can say about it. But there is some more that we have to say about it. We have to say something about the book of Leviticus. Let's understand what Leviticus is. First of all, let's understand the context. Leviticus is a book that's written about the character of God. It's actually a beautiful book. It's just not interesting to read your first time through. But the point of the book of Leviticus is to remind us that while we like to see God as our best friend and God loves us, God loves us, but God is not like us. That there is this gap that exists between us and God in theology. We call this transcendence. It's called otherness. That God is something different than human beings. And that God calls God's people to be holy just as God is holy. So the whole book is about God's holiness. And therefore the people of Israel, God's chosen people, God's call for them to be holy. It also has a historical concern. The book of Leviticus is a book of laws, rituals, and prescriptions that was given to the Israelites during their wandering in the wilderness. So those of you who've been around a while know the story. They left Egypt. God led them out of Egypt. God said, I have a, a promised land prepared for you, but before you can enter the promised land, we got to get them some things straight. And he gave them the book of Leviticus. Practically speaking, the concern was this. The Israelites were about to go into a new land, a land that was swarming with all sorts of other tribes, roughly called the Canaanites, which included all sorts of different tribes. And the book of Leviticus was God's reminder that I'm sending you out into a land that's swarming with all sorts of habits, traditions, characteristics, lifestyles, and I'm calling you to be a holy people in the midst of that land. So you guys, does this make sense? So the book of Leviticus, the primary concern is that the Israelites, once they enter into the promised land, maintain their separateness, their unique identity as God's holy people. The reason is this, that God had a plan for them. God was going to use the people of Israel to be a blessing to all the rest of the nations. So God needed them to be holy as God was holy. And then finally, the book of Leviticus has prescriptions for when people mess up, because we know that people mess up. So it has all these sacrificial systems that help people overcome that gap whenever they mess up. So you can roughly break the book into two parts. Half of it is for priests, instruction for priests. Half of it is instructions for people, the Israelites, to live holy lives in the midst of the land of the Canaanites. And so what we get to here with Leviticus 18 and 20, these verses that I just read, is what scholars call the holiness code. This is a whole listing of rules and regulations, rituals, that help the Israelites maintain their unique identity in the promised land. And there's a few overarching concerns that we have to pay attention to. If you read the whole thing, a few overarching concerns. One is sexual relationships. That it was apparent that in the land of the Canaanites, there, was a, uh, there were not a lot of rules around sex. God said, we've got to clean this up a little bit. Secondly, a family life, kind of how we relate to a family. And then finally, what we might call treatment of other people, treatment of the poor, treatment of aliens. Uh, that's a huge concern in Leviticus. Okay, so it's in that context that we get to Leviticus 18 and 20, which lists a bunch of prescriptions for the Israelites that includes things like bestiality, incest, sex with a woman on her period, and then same-sex relationships. 
So again, Leviticus 18 uh, says this. It says, you shall not lie with a male as with a woman. It's an abomination. Then it moves on. Again, in Leviticus 20, these are both chapters that deal with sexual issues. If a man lies with a male as with a woman, both of them have committed an abomination. Then it adds a consequence. They shall be put to death. Their blood is upon them. Okay, the Hebrew word here for abomination is this. It's toive, which means detestable, uh, uh, offensive practice, something that's not done, that's distasteful to God. It's used not only to describe men sleeping with other men in the Old Testament, but it's also used to describe these other activities, idolatry, eating unclean animals, sacrificing animals with defects, sacrificing human beings, and witchcraft. Sorry, witches. Now, Leviticus chapter 20. Well, it does. That's, thank you for laughing. It's good that we can <laughs> laugh a little bit. Okay, Leviticus after, uh, chapter 20 adds the death sentence, right? It says the punishment is death. Death in chapter 20, is also the punishment for the following crimes. Cursing your mother and father, you're screwed. A lot of you are (laughs) screwed. Did I just say screwed? I probably shouldn't. (laughs) You're not in a good place. Adultery, a variety of incestual relationships, and once again being a spiritual medium or practicing witchcraft. These are all death penalty cases. Now, historically, let me say real quick, most scholars think that while the death penalty may have been used in certain instances, it was more of of something to let people know how serious this was. In reality, there were things people could do for, for making up, for cursing their mother and father, for example. They didn't go around putting tons of people to death. Okay, as I said before, the overriding concern here in all these rules is Israelites' distinction when they entered the promised land. Some of this was about holiness. Some of this was practical cleanliness stuff. Some of these sexual things were meant to protect and maintain the procreation and population growth of the Israelites once they they entered the land. Some of these laws were very practical in nature. Others of them don't connect much with us now. And within this context, the scripture is clear about this. It's clear that for the Israelites entering the promised land, God did not want men sleeping with other men. It doesn't say anything about lesbian relationships. And so let me say something about Leviticus. There's two things that we have to avoid doing when we read the book of Leviticus. First, we cannot just say, well, the Bible said it, therefore I believe it, case closed. We can't do that. Here's the reason why. Anyone, conservative, liberal, knows that the book of Leviticus contains a whole bunch of things. And there's a lot in the book of Leviticus that we don't listen to anymore. Right here in this chapter, for example, uh, sleeping with a woman when she's on her period. There's very few Christians that still believe that's a death sentence sort of thing. In other words, when we read the book of Leviticus, we have some work to do. We have to decide which of these things we follow and which of these things we don't. We can't just take it all and say, the Bible said it, I believe it. One of the first principles of biblical interpretation is understanding that when Jesus came, he changed the way that we see the Old Testament law. So we have to remember that. So that's on one side. The other extreme is this. We also can't just say, well, that's in the Old Testament. I don't believe that. I got to throw that out. No. The truth is, the Old Testament said it, and we have to figure out if that was a particular law for a particular group of people with a given historical context that in light of Jesus no longer holds, or if it's a law that holds for all places and for all times. Now, as much as we'd like uh, the chapter in Leviticus to answer that critical question, the truth is it doesn't. We have to answer it. So we have to look at these verses in light of the New Testament and in light of the witness of Jesus. So we're going to do that. We're going to move on to the New Testament. But I just remind you that there is a lot in the book of Leviticus that we now see is no longer holding true because of the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. Most notably, the dietary laws are a good example in the New Testament. Okay, good. We know what Leviticus says, but we know it doesn't answer any question yet. We have to do some work. Let's go to the New Testament. And the first uh, passage I want to go to, I'm going to skip over Romans. We're going to come back to Romans. We're going to go to two related passages. The first one is 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9. Okay? 
There's two related verses where Paul talks about a whole list of sins. Let me read this for you. Euk oidate hoiti adikoi theo basileon. O kleronome susen me planaste ute pornoi ute et alola trai ute moikoi ute malakoi ute arsenakotais. Okay, let me read it in English. That was Greek. I'm not doing that to be cute. I really am not. I'm doing that for a reason. The reason is this. It's written in in Greek. That's the way Paul wrote it, the way I read it. Admittedly, I don't usually speak Greek out loud, so I'm a little rusty. But anytime you pick up your Bible and, and you read it, remember that somewhere somebody read what I just read and had to make choices about what those words mean, right? Now let's open up your Bible and mine. They may have have different choices in them. They may look different, but let me read what mine says. Corinthians chapter 6, uh, verse 9. It says this, Do you not know that wrongdoers will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Fornicators, idolaters, adulterers, male prostitutes, sodomites, thieves, the greedy, drunkards, revelers, robbers, none of these will inherit the kingdom of God. Okay, and then let me flip over. We're going to deal again with two because they're related. The next one is Paul's letter to Timothy. This is chapter 1, and I'll start in verse 9. Very similar passage. Verse 9. This means understanding that the law is laid down not for the innocent, but for the lawless and disobedient, for the godless and sinful, for the unholy and profane, for those who kill their father or mother, For murderers, fornicators, sodomites, slave traders, liars, perjurers, and whatever else is contrary to the sound teaching that conforms to the glorious gospel of the blessed God. Okay. In both these passages, Paul is writing what's known as a classical vice list. This is where he compares, and we talked about this last week when I talked about sexual sin. This is where he compares the way that God calls people to live And the way instead that so many people live, especially those that are outside of Christ. And so this is an example of him calling people to live a way different than the culture lives. And it is, like I said, important to remember, and especially with these passages, that we're reading a foreign language that had a whole different worldview than the one that we have today. So what I want to show you is that these passages are particularly tricky because throughout time they've been interpreted different ways. In fact, some of you know that it wouldn't be a sermon of mine if I didn't bring a chart or a map, right? So I brought a chart. Do you want to put that up at both the sides? Let's put up my chart. Okay, can you see this chart? This chart uh, just shows you the way that the two most controversial words here, we'll talk about them in a second, malakoi and arsenakotai, have been translated throughout time. We'll we'll skip the Latin, nobody knows Latin. And then let's go to 1508, lecherous and the sin of Sodom. You can just go down the line and see weaklings, abusers of themselves with mankind, effeminate, It goes all the way down, and then you get to 1946. In 1946, someone made a decision to take these two Greek words and to translate them both as homosexual. That's what they decided. So if you pick up a Revised Standard Version of the Bible, New Testament was published in 1946, what you'll see in your Bible is that in two places uh, that it speaks out against homosexual. Since then, both the New International Version, widely used in evangelical churches, and the New Revised standard widely used in mainline churches, Uh, both of them have changed the translation of those words to male prostitute, and then in the case of the New International, it's homosexual offenders and male prostitutes and sodomites. Let me say a quick word about sodomites because it's kind of a tricky word. We could preach a whole sermon about this. Sodomite is probably, it's it's a word that's been with us for a long time. It refers to the Old Testament story of Sodom and Gomorrah, you know, the, the, the hallmark wicked cities in the Old Testament. The story is found in Genesis 19. You can go home and read it. Genesis 19, though, has uh, some angels from God visiting a town. Once they get to the town, they see the wickedness of Sodom. The, and the wickedness is manifold. I mean, this is a, a bad place. And the men of Sodom come to Lot's house where the two angels are staying. 
And they demand Lot to turn over the men so that they can gang rape them. That's what the story's about. And Lot says, no, I'm not going to do that. And they say, well, we're coming in anyway. And the angels strike them blind, and then God destroys the city. That's it in a nutshell. Now, for a long time, people said, see, look, that means that men aren't supposed to sleep with other men. Now, both conservative and liberal scholars alike believe that that's largely just a, a misappropriation of that story. That that story's about violence. It's about just an awful worshiping of sexual lust. It's about perversion. It's, a, a, it's about uh, being inhospitable toward God and others. It's not really about same-sex relationships. But nonetheless, the word sodomite has come to denote kind of a whole range of sexual activity, especially violent sexual activity. Usually it uh, is used as a word to talk about anal sex, or in some cases oral sex. It's gotten into medieval Europe. It's in our laws in the United States. We used to have sodomy laws. So that word is kind of a loaded word, but it, it, it basically refers back to a historical story about people who put their sexual desires above anything else and violently sought to rape other men. So in all these cases, it usually denotes sort of the aggressor or the active person in a male-on-male sex act. Okay, but let's understand what these words mean. And I know this is technical, but this is important because this is what we say Uh, we base our beliefs on. So let's talk about it. The first word that's used in 1 Corinthians is malikos. You saw all the ways that it was interpreted. The Greek word meant soft. That's what it meant. It was used in relationship to cloth. Now follow this and it makes sense. So what they, when they use the word malikos, they were referring to cloth. Jesus uses this in the gospels to, to describe the kind of clothes that rich people wear, kings wear. Well, it came to be used pejoratively to describe soft men. In other words, men who weren't very masculine or what we might call effeminate men. So if you go back to uh, the time that Paul was writing, it's almost universally agreed upon that Malachos refers to sort of young, effeminate male prostitutes or callboys that was common in ancient Greece and to some degree Rome. Okay, that's what he's describing there. We'll get to that in a second. The second word is uh, a little bit more controversial. The second word is arsenakotai. And the truth is, we don't really know what this means because we don't find it anywhere else. Some think that Paul made it up, that he made up the word, and that the word is based on the Greek translation of those old Leviticus terms. So some scholars will say arsenakotai refers to any man who has sex with another man. That's what it refers to. Other people will pull back and say that's not exactly what it meant. In fact, we don't have evidence that that's what it meant. In fact, they say that what it probably denotes is if Malikos is the effeminate young callboy person, then Arsenakotai refers to the older, active partner in male-on-male sex in Greco-Roman society. Okay? That's what a lot of scholars think that it means. So, so what are we dealing with here? I have to describe the historical context of this before we can move on. The historical context is this. When we look back at Greek and Roman society and we consider uh, male and male sex, this was the, the picture of those kind of sexual relationships that they had. It wasn't uncommon in Greco-Roman society for men to sleep with other women, to a, men, and to a lesser degree, women to sleep with other women, but it was always in the context of a unique relationship. And the unique relationship we sometimes refer to as pederasty, and what it means is this, in Greek society, an older man, usually a wealthy one, would take under his wing a, a younger man with the permission of that young man's father for the purposes of teaching, mentoring, and friendship. And you can go back in Greek literature and see this relationship all over the place. And part of this relationship was education. Part of it was learning warfare. Part of it was learning how to be a a Greek aristocrat. And oftentimes, not always, oftentimes it included sexual favors and acts between the older man and the younger man. The younger man was always in a passive role. The older man was always in the active role. And this became quite uh, acceptable in Greek society. Plato criticized it. You see some philosophers criticizing it. 
If you flop over to the Roman side of things, the Romans, particularly in this area where where Paul is dealing with Corinth and the Greek part of the Roman Empire, this was a common practice amongst Romans as well. By the time Paul was writing, it had kind of evolved from this very formal, sort of aristocratic relationship to also sort of a, a base form of it, where basically older, wealthy, married men would go out and hire uh, young, either slaves, it had to be if you were Roman, or poorer uh, Greek men in order to have kind of a sexual partner on the side. So when Paul writes about same-sex relationships, when the Scripture thinks of same-sex relationships, they don't think of anything like what we might understand as orientation. They don't think of, of loving, intimate, committed relationships the way that we're now being challenged to think about them. Instead, they're thinking about this institution of older men leaving their marriage to seek out the education of and sex with younger men. So these two Greek words, there's a very good argument that what these two Greek words are, are the two men respectively in this common sex act. So when Paul writes out against it in 1 Timothy, and when Paul writes out against it in 1 Corinthians, what he's really writing out against, I think, and what a lot of scholars think, is he's saying, look, I know that this is how the culture lives. This has become okay in the culture, but for those of us who follow Christ, it's not good enough. It's a form of adultery to leave your marriage. It's worshiping sexual lust above all else. This is a practice that's got to stop. And so he's calling the men, particularly that are reading this, to take uh, their sexual energy and use it in the context of the marriages that they're in, not to leave them for these other kind of relationships. Okay, does that make sense? We good? Let's move to Romans real quick. Romans chapter 1, verse 26. And I'll say ahead of time, I really think this is the hardest passage. This is the one that if you really boil it all down, people who maintain the position that the Bible speaks out against same-sex relationships basically go to Romans 1. They basically will concede all the rest of those texts uh, are a little bit uncertain, but they'll go to Romans 1. And let's read verse 26 and verse 27. It says this, therefore, that's an important therefore we'll get to in a minute. Therefore, God gave them up in the lusts of their hearts to impurity, to the degrading of their bodies among themselves. Because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie, and they worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. Okay, that's what comes before it. Now verse 26. For this reason, God gave them up to degrading passions. Their women exchanged natural intercourse for unnatural, And in the same way also, the men, giving up natural intercourse with women, were consumed with passion for one another. Men committed shameless acts with men and received in their own persons the due penalty for their error. Okay. Let's go through it quickly, and then we'll get to some closing remarks. Many scholars of all camps would agree that the interpretations I've shared thus far uh, are at least possible, are accurate. But Romans is the divisive passage, really. A traditional interpretation, and the way a lot of scholars see it, is they will look at this passage, they will say, look, it's clear that here Paul is talking about men with men, women with women. He's talking about it in a very general sense. He's calling up images of creation which indicate that these kind of behavior, behaviors are really contrary to the way God created us, male and female, for each other. And that Romans 1 is proof that Paul, and therefore the Scripture, understands same-sex relationships of any and every kind to be a sinful distortion of the way God created us to be. That's the argument in a nutshell. And I want to say this, you could read the text that way. In fact, for the majority of Christian history, we've never really had a reason. Nobody's ever really pushed. Uh, It's never been a cultural issue. And so we've never really questioned that interpretation. But the truth is, when you look at Romans, let me point out a couple of things. First, what Paul is talking about here is Gentile idolatry. He's talking about Gentiles. And he's making an argument to the Jews saying, look, these Gentiles are sinful. And 
Case in point, evidence of their sin is their idolatry. This is true kind of all over Scripture, that kind of number one sin is idolatry. In other words, it, when they should be worshiping God, instead they turn and begin worshiping something else. And I talked about this last week and the week before in sexual sin. We still do this. When we confuse God with the things God has made, we start worshiping things God has made. And one of the most common things that they worshiped, and we still do today, is our own sense of pleasure, sex included. So literally back then, they worshiped Aphrodite and Venus, the Greek god goddesses of love. They would go to these temples and they'd uh, just participate in sort of debauched sexual ritual. There was a philosophy amongst some of the Greeks that the most important thing in life, what we ought to worship, is our own sense of satisfaction and pleasure. By the way, that still exists today. I see a lot of people that first and foremost in their life is, I'm going to be happy, I'm going to do whatever feels good, I'm going to seek after my own pleasure above all else. One example of the way that this is lived out is people throwing open the rules of their sexual life and instead doing whatever feels good. And for some of these people, it meant leaving their marriages, going off and just having sex with whoever, men with men, women with women, and these relationships that I just described were very common in Greek and Roman times. Paul is making the argument, look, that's not the way God calls us to live. By the way, the real point of Romans 1 is at the end he says this, look, they're sinful, we know that. By the way, you guys are sinful too, we know that. In other words, we're all sinful, and Jesus saves us all. That's his basic point. But it's essentially a passage about idolatry, dealing with a sin that was common at that time, dealing with people who would seek after sex and sexual pleasure above all else. And that's what Paul is condemning in Romans 1. Now, those are the five verses in Scripture. Jesus doesn't say anything about it. The Old Testament doesn't refer to it anywhere else. The New Testament doesn't talk about it anywhere else other than the verses that I read. You can go home and study those five verses. I'm going to make a couple of remarks as we get ready to close. First this. Unlike my conservative friends... I cannot say that I think Scripture names all gay and lesbian acts as sinful. I'll admit that I'm, I'm, you know, people, we like these labels, conservative, liberal. I'm neither one. I freely admit I, I, I really don't fit into either of those categories. I believe in Scripture to a degree that some of my more liberal friends would say, ugh. And some of my conservative friends would champion. But on this issue, I simply disagree with them. I don't think Scripture names all gay and lesbian acts as sinful. In fact, I don't believe that. And I respect that after looking at all the evidence, some of my my friends do believe that. They believe the Bible condemns all same-sex behavior, regardless of whether or not it is in the context of a committed, loving, and intimate relationship. I'll also go on to say that I think that's a reasonable interpretation of Scripture, actually. That is a perfectly reasonable interpretation of Scripture, but it is not a necessary interpretation of Scripture, and it's by no means a certain interpretation. One does not need to see the text that way. One has to choose to interpret the text that way. And I think that when you take those five passages alongside the whole witness of Jesus' life, his death, his resurrection, his fulfillment and abolishment of the law— his new creation where there's not differences between male, female, slave, free, rich, poor. When you take it alongside the whole witness of Scripture, I just think that we can come up with a better interpretation. In fact, Jesus said you will know them by their fruit. And the truth is, I know God-honoring, Christ-believing, spirit-filled people who are gay and lesbian. So I don't think that the Bible condemns all same-sex behaviors. And I know that on this point, I lose friends, and some people who listen to me today will disagree and walk away from friendship or respect of me. Let me make another point. 
The other point is this. We unfairly weight issues of human sexuality as a worse offense than other things in the Bible. We do this all the time. Because our culture is so tied up right now in this issue, we raise it to a level that just isn't evident in Scripture. Scripture talks about it five times. We talk about it all the time. The violent protest that some pastors and churches show against gay and lesbian people shows an anxiety and a fear that just betrays anything that I can find in Scripture. There are people that believe our world is going to hell in a handbasket, that this is exhibit A, and they show so little faith that Jesus has died, has rose again, and is in charge, and that we have a sovereign God who has control of this world. Furthermore, I would say that same-sex issues are cloudy at best right now. Co- scientists aren't exactly sure. We know it's a complex issue of nature and nurture. And it seems like so many people are so scared and come down with such a condemning tone that it's just not warranted in Scripture, even if you did think it was a sin. Thirdly, let me say this really briefly to my liberal friends. I disagree with a lot of what you do with Scripture, because I think in our effort to affirm same-sex relationships, we've just thrown sexual ethics out the window, and we don't talk enough about what God does speak about in Scripture. My liberal friends, we have got to get back to talking about sex in church, because there are some things that Bible, the Bible clearly does say are wrong. We need to get back to being willing and able to speak about those things. And then finally, the stuff that I really think is important. Listen to this. 21.5% of gay and lesbian teenagers have suicidal thoughts compared to 4.2% of straight kids. In religiously conservative areas, these numbers are higher. In other words, where people claim to love Jesus more, to follow the Bible more, to be more religious, are the places where gay and lesbian teenagers are the most oppressed and the most suicidal. Now, many of my friends will claim that they love the sinner and that they hate the sin. But if we believe, I mean, we are just fooling ourselves on that. You're not loving the sinner. The evidence is clear that even churches that believe homosexuality is a sin, they're doing almost nothing to love gay and lesbian teenagers who are going through that discernment or gay and lesbian parishioners. Instead, we turn our angst into our latest social crusade and we create an environment that's fundamentally hostile to these young people. As a church of any stripe, whatever you believe, I don't care, but we have to spend less time. We have to spend less time dismissing or criticizing or hating this sin. We cannot dismiss real people who are created in the image of God. You can't wash your hands of the emotional, the psychological consequences that your preaching and teaching creates when you condemn gay and lesbians over and over again. I really think of some of my pastor friends, they're more concerned with looking too liberal than they are with loving uh, people. That's not right. That's a sin. And then finally this. To each and every gay and lesbian person in this room, or each and every mother or father, brother, sister, aunt and uncle, friend of a gay and lesbian person in this room, I don't much care if the rest of you listen to this or not. I want to speak to you right now. The 10-ton weight of guilt and shame and self-doubt and condemnation and fear that you live with breaks my heart. It does. And that the church has perpetrated this cannot, is not defensible according to Scripture. It breaks my heart, and it doesn't have to be that way. And I really feel called that God sent me to create a church where you are welcome to come. Christ said, my yoke is easy, my burden is light. Paul argues in Galatians that there are no more distinctions. The only distinction is this, 
Are you totally and completely devoted to Christ? Do you put your whole trust in him? I don't believe that you're inherently sinful simply because you're attracted to people of the same sex. I don't believe you're sinful if you practice sex in the context of a committed, intimate, lifelong relationship for the purposes of pleasure and companionship and intimacy. And you do not need to despair or forever feel judged by being who you are. Having said that, let me challenge you. Because this is not an anything goes thing. Gay and lesbian parishioners, people listening to me, same thing goes for you as it goes for straight people and the stuff I talked about last week. Christ calls us to holiness in our sexuality. And your different sexuality isn't a license to go off and to do whatever you like. And I see that. I've sat in the same room and seen the brokenness of men and women, particularly men, gay men in this congregation. You can't just go down to just John's or JJ's or Attitudes or Novak's or Clementine's or anywhere else, pick up a guy, go home and sleep with him, and expect to not feel anything the next day. That's still sin. That's worshiping a a God of sexual pleasure. And God calls Christian gay men and women to a higher standard. So as best I can, I've tried to teach you what the Bible says and what sense I can make of it. There are certainly a lot more things that I could say, a lot more testimonies that I could give. In closing, I'll only say that it's my calling to challenge people to commit their life to Christ. That is issue number one. Have faith in his atoning death. Have hope in his resurrection. Live lives worthy of the calling to which you have received. Gay people can do that. But oftentimes, gay or straight, we fail to do that. And I want to call you to Christ and to Christ alone. As I end, I'm reminded of something Jesus said to his disciples. They were nervous because of Jesus' unwillingness to crack down on people who were different. And Jesus looked at them and he said in uh, the Gospel of Matthew, he basically said, stop trying to make enemies. If people are not against us, they're for us. And then he says this. He says, if any of you, he's looking at the disciples, if any of you put a stumbling block before one of the little ones who believes in me, it would be better for you if a great millstone were hung around your neck and you were thrown into the sea. I get into the history of that, but you get the point, right? Belief in him was the only distinguishing mark. So friends, be careful. This is a warning. Be careful of throwing up roadblocks to those who have faith in Christ. Be careful of throwing up roadblocks to those who want to seek Christ. I, for one, will not be the stumbling block for gay and lesbian people who believe in Christ. And neither will this church so long as I'm the pastor of it. Amen.